Almalexia, mother of Morrowind, queen, and goddess. These are but a few of the monikers she went under during her time on Nern. The Tribunal were some of the most influential figures in Tamriel's history, but now their memory echoes through time like a long-forgotten hymn of the Ashlanders. It has been millennia since Queen Inderal Armalexia and the Tribunal departed this world. Their story is one of humble beginnings, bitter deceit, benevolent rule, and tragic endings. However, there are still those who remember the Mother of Morrowind and seek to rebuild their Lady's Temple and cast down the dissidents so that she may reclaim her empire and deliver the Dunma people to greatness once more, under the guiding hands of the Tribunal. This is the tale of Almalexia and the story of the Ghosts of the Tribunal. When I first entered the Great Chamber, I was there again, in the High Chapel, nestled in her glow. Great pillars surrounded the stone where the goddess Almalexia once stood. As if it were washed in the fire, Mournhold had shed its skin to reveal a temple of rock and bone. I knew then that this stone was the heart of our goddess, and through faith, Love and sweat, we have slowly restored her flesh. Now that she is almost complete, my thoughts turn to my old friend, Erdin Relville. He was the diviner whose scrying brought us to this holy place. Without him, none of this would be possible. Yet time and toil changed him, to the point I questioned his devotion. Wherever he is, I hope he has regained his love for her. Regardless, our work does not end there. With her hands to guide me, we will rid this world of her dissidents. We will reunite the fires of hope and truth under her banner and theirs, and let the light of Almsivi shine on servants and apostates alike. To understand Almalexia's story, we have to flick back through the pages of history. Almalexia had protected and governed over the Myrrh of Morrowind, or Res Dane, as it used to be known, since late in the First Era, as one of three Myrrh, calling themselves the Tribunal, otherwise known as Alm Sevi. She was very popular amongst the Dunma, as she ruled from her temple in Mournhold. Her people knew her as the source of compassion, sympathy, and forgiveness, the protector of the poor and weak, the patron of teachers and healers. Alongside Armalexia was Vivek, the warrior poet, and Sothasil, the magician. Together, the tribunal was worshipped not as saints, lords or kings, but as gods. Their wisdom, power, and right to rule was unquestionable and resolute, as they served as spiritual, religious, and political leaders to their people. For a time, it seemed as if the tribunal had the greater good of their people in mind, and were for the most part a peaceful regime, despite their deceitful rise to power. For there was once a time when Almalexia was no god, but in fact a mortal queen. Many years ago, long before the time of Dark Elves or Dunma as we know them today, Morrowind was inhabited by their ancestors, the Kaima. The Kaima, meaning the Changed Ones, were led by their prophet Valoth out of their ancestral homelands during the Merithic Era to settle in the lands of Resdane in search of a new life. Later, in the First Era, Almalexia married a Chimeri general named Sergio Inderel Nerevar Mora, bringing their respected houses of Inderel and Mora closer together in a time when the Chima were not yet fully united. The First Era was a time of great strife for the Chima people, as tensions grew between the Chima and the other natives of Resdane, the Dwemer. The Dwemer or Deep Elves, were an agnostic and technologically superior race of Myrrh, choosing to live underground to focus on their pursuits of logic and reason, far away from the tribalistic and barbaric Kaima and their fictional gods. However, in the 416th year of the First Era, 
Indarel Nerevar had succeeded in uniting all the Kaima clans and houses under one banner. For his exploits in battle, he was heralded as a hero and appointed Hortator of his people, a title rarely bestowed throughout history, given to those who would help lead the Kaima people as one during times of crisis. With this, an uneasy alliance was formed between the now united Kaima and the Dwemer, giving birth to the First Council. Under the rule of the Hortator and Dumak Dwarf King, the leader of the Dwemer, this council united the two races as a single political entity for the first and only time in Tamriel's history to protect Resdane from the invading Nord forces of Skyrim. Queen Armalexia, Sothasil, and Vivek served Indorel Nerevar and the Kaima forces faithfully as their military strategists in the war against the Northmen. Their advice and keen strategic thinking would prove fruitful and would lead to the successful retreat of the invading forces of Skyrim. The alliance between the Dwemer and the United Kaima would not last, however, as the War of the First Council began. Deep beneath Red Mountain, the Dwemer discovered the heart of a god. This heart belonged to the entity known as Lorcan, the being who was responsible for persuading the Aedra into sacrificing part of their essence to birth the mortal realm. Lorcan's divine spark housed within the heart possess the essence of the gods. It was this essence the Dwemer seek to capture in order to ascend to godhood themselves. To achieve this, specialist tools known as Keening, Sunder and Wraithguard were crafted by Lord Kagranak, the chief tunnel architect of the Dwemer, to harvest the power from the heart. This blasphemy greatly angered Nerevar and the Kaima people. Nerevar pleaded with Dumak to cease these unholy actions, but his plea went unheeded. The War of the First Council began, and culminated with the Battle of Red Mountain. All of the great houses of Morrowind and the Kaima clans met the Dwemer on the slopes of Red Mountain to engage in one of the bloodiest battles that Nern had ever bore witness to. Although the Kaima united were fierce on the battleground, the Dwemer held sheer power in their homunculi, cold machines capable of tearing flesh from bone with ease. The loss of life during the battle was significant, but Nerevar would not concede. Pushing upwards through Red Mountain, he laid siege upon Dumak's citadel. Nerevar led his most elite warriors, along with the Tribunal and Vorin Dagoth, through a hidden valley that led deep into the bowels of Red Mountain, to the chamber containing the heart of Lorcan. It was there that Nerevar and Vorin Dagoth confronted Dumak and Kagranak, 
pleading with them once more to not use these profane tools upon the heart, but they would not listen. Nerevar slew Dumak, but before he could confiscate the tools, Kagranak, fueled by grief and rage, attempted to use them on the heart. Many believe that Kagranak was successful, because on that day, the Battle of Red Mountain suddenly ended when every Dwemer on Tamriel simultaneously disappeared from the face of Nern. Exactly what fate befell the Dwemer is unknown. However, what is known is that Vorin gathered up the tools where Kagranak once stood and demanded they be cast into the magma pools surrounding the heart chamber. Nerevar, mortally wounded, prevented Vorin from destroying the tools and instead ordered him to guard them with his life, as he would first seek counsel from his queen and the rest of the tribunal on the appropriate course of action. Nerevar and the tribunal concluded that the tools must be protected and hidden away in secret in case of the Dwemer's return, and made the tribunal swear an oath before Azura herself to pledge that they would never wield these tools with the same intent as the Dwemer. Together they returned to Vorin to retrieve the tools, but when they arrived, he was deranged, psychotic, and driven mad. Infected by the tools' immense power from the heart, Vorin proclaimed himself to be Dagoth Ur, the rightful owner of the tools, and that the power now belonged to House Dagoth. With no other choice, Nerevar dealt Dagoth a grievous injury before falling victim to his own. Now, if something about the ending of this story didn't sit right with you, you would be correct. Maybe. Possibly. Allow me to explain. Accounts of what took place during the Battle of Red Mountain differ depending on who you ask or who's telling the tale. There is a recount of this tale, with a much more sinister resolution. In that version of our tale, the Tribunal were overcome with greed at the notion of obtaining such godlike powers for themselves, and so, the Tribunal unmercifully murdered their Lord Nerevar within the Heart Chamber when returning to collect the tools from Vorin, and after already pledging their oath to the Daedric Prince Azura. Whether this betrayal was premeditated or an action taken collectively and impulsively by the three, it is said that Dagoth lay completely incapacitated by the power of Kagranak's tools, and the Tribunal took advantage of Nerevar's diminished capabilities due to his injuries, committing the most foul of murders upon Nerevar, first rendering him incapable with poison robes, candles and incantations. Vivek pierced his heart with his spear of Muatra, his face was seathered by Sothasil, and feet removed above the ankles by Almalexia. Being placed in her lap as she looked on at her lord, watching the life drain from his mortal vessel. This moment would be the catalyst for the tribunal to come into power, as their betrayal of sacred oaths would continue. Regardless of which count you take as fact, the fact of the matter is that after that day at Red Mountain, Sotha Sil continued to research the properties of Kagranak's tools, and would eventually approach Armalexia in her never-ending grief or regret, and convinced her that with these tools, they could usher in a new age. The age of the great Kaima Empire. He filled her head with visions of peace and prosperity to which the Kaima people had never known, and that they themselves would rule over this new world as gods. The three ventured into the bowels of Red Mountain with the profane tools of Kagranak and the intent to become gods. Using these tools upon the heart, they struck it, releasing the immense power contained within it and channeled it into themselves. With this, the tribunal was transformed into gods. This transgression did not go unnoticed by the Daedric Prince Azura, however. Azura appeared before the tribunal in all her mighty rage to chastise them for their murder of Nerevar and intentions to become gods. You have failed, but it seems that is your fate. It was Sotha Sil, now with a new divinity and purpose, stood before Azura and denounced the Daedra, proclaiming themselves to be the new gods. Go now, all will fall. Leave as you entered, or you too must fall. Enraged, Azura cursed the entire Kaima race, turning their golden skin ashen and burning their eyes blood red, transforming the Kaima into the Dunma. This curse was to serve as a reminder never to doubt the power of their true Daedric gods. Azura foretold that one day their murdered lord Inderel Nerevar would return, reincarnated by her hands to bring about the downfall of the tribunal 
and their falsehoods. At first, mayhem erupted all across Vardenfell like an eruption from Red Mountain, as every Dunmer cowered in fear at their new appearance. However, the tribunal addressed the Chimer in mass, reassuring their people that this change was in fact a gift from them, a token of their power, and a symbol of the new age to come. The Chimer people were no more, and from that moment forward, they would forever be known as the Dunmer, with the Tribunal as their new gods. For hundreds of years, the Tribunal reigned supreme over the lands of Vardenfell. That was until the Third Era, when the Tribunal began to crumble. A soul sickness sweeped the land, Dunmer all over Morrowind were afflicted with terrible dreams, and storms of blight ash billowed through the streets. For deep within Red Mountain, the deranged Dagoth Ur had returned. Healed from his wounds, he sought revenge on the Tribunal, and had concocted plans to take over the lands of Vardenfell. With him he brought the divine disease known as Corpus, and had established the malicious Sixth House. Dagoth and his Ash Vampire forces were able to steal Sunder and Keening right from under the benevolent gaze of the Tribunal, preventing them from maintaining their godlike powers. You see, in order for the Tribunal to maintain their connection with the Heart of Lorcan, they would have to periodically make the pilgrimage into Red Mountain to perform a ritual to replenish their powers. As the Tribunal's powers faded, rumours of the Tribunal's right to rule were spread amongst the populace. Dissident priests wrote scripture revealing how the Tribunal had been deceiving their people with false history. A prisoner, born on a certain day to uncertain parents, would be sent under guard to Morrowind, would overcome numerous trials, and, eventually, unite the province and cast down the Tribunal as false gods. This is the prophecy of the Nerevarin, Third Era, Year 427. The reincarnation of Inderel Nerevar had arrived in Morrowind. Through much trial and tribulation, the Incarnate would succeed in destroying the Heart of Lorcan and vanquishing Dagoth Ur and the Sixth House. Without the Heart, it was only a matter of time before the Tribunal were left completely powerless and mortal once more. Vivek had quietly come to terms with his fate and gladly aided the Nerevarine in their quest of redemption on behalf of Azura. Almalexia, on the other hand, was driven mad as her godlike powers began to slip through her fingers. She isolated herself from her people, and as a result, their faith began to waver even further. Faced with her mortality, Almalexia became a tyrant. Where she was once known as the healing mother of Morrowind, to her people, she would become something much, much darker. Paranoia, jealousy, and rage. These things consumed Ormalexia, and she became suspicious of Vivek and Sothasil, fearing their betrayal was imminent. So like she had done to her husband millennia ago, she murdered Sothasil in his own realm of the Clockwork City. She would unleash a wrath upon her city of Mournhold. If she couldn't rule through power, she would rule through fear. She terrorized her people into maintaining their faith in her, and subsequently, her power and rightful place as the one true ruler of Morrowind. Almalexia had become a real threat, not only to the Myr of Morrowind, but to the people of Tamriel. Nerevarine, here it ends. This clockwork city was to be your death. You were to be my greatest martyr. The heroic Nerevarine, sacrificing all to protect Morrowind from the mad Sulfur Sill. I will tell my people how with your dying breath you proclaimed your devotion to me, the one true god. Your death will end this prophecy and unite my people again under one god, one faith, one rule by my divine law. I will be the savior of my people. I alone will be their salvation. None may stand in my way. Not you, and certainly not Vivek. Thankfully, before Almalexia could create any more discourse in the land, she was defeated at the hands of the Incarnate, her husband, the Nerevarine. Brought back by Azura's hand herself, 
to reprimand the tribunal for their sins so many years ago. Morrowind has since been liberated from the tribunal temple. In its place, a new temple was formed, the House of Reclamations, dedicated to the worship of the original Dunmeri Pantheon. Why do we rejoice that the tribunal has fallen and their false promises are but a memory? We rejoice as the new temple rises. We rejoice because we embrace the Reclamations as our saviors. Who are the Reclamations? The Reclamations are Azura, Mephala, and Boethia. They mean to reclaim what was lost from the Tribunal's falsehoods and lies. Who are the perpetrators of those falsehoods? Sothasil, Amalexia, and Vivek. Saints who were never meant to be the cornerstones of our faith. However, there are still those who are devout to the worship of the Tribunal, doing so in secrecy, gaining power in numbers and slowly over time, hoping to restore Alm Sivi to their rightful place of worship, with Alm Alexia at the helm. If Alm Alexia really could return to Tamriel, it could spell disaster. But how could such a thing be possible? Well, rumours have recently started creeping through this sleepy hollow of a town known as Raven Rock, of the Tribunal's return. Raven Rock is situated on the southern coast of Solstheim, and is now mostly populated by the Dunma, who have sought refuge here after the second eruption of Red Mountain. It is in this dusty and ashen town that sits the Temple of Reclamation. It is here, down in the living quarters, that lies an unsuspecting journal that may help us begin to unravel these strange rumours of Om Sivi's return to Tamriel. Heretic's Dossier, Blacksmith's Confessional. Kendro was a strange one, always skulking about, pursuing my wares, but never buying. I'd ask him if he wanted a sword, and he'd say, Not today. So I'd ask him if he'd fancy a set of armour, and again he says, Not today. Every day for a month, the same song and dance. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever, or so I thought. One day I open the shop, check my wares, and find a mistake in the shipment. Inside the crate is an odd blue gem, lumped in with the usual iron and steel. Figured it for a mistake, I was about to send it back. When Kenra walks in the store, I give him the usual greeting and ask him if he wants to buy some wares fully expecting him to say the words. Not today. But to my surprise, he doesn't. Today he wants to buy. He doesn't want a sword or a shield. He wants the gem. As he hands me the coin, I get a strange feeling in the pit of my stomach, like this is the last time I'll see him. So I ask him where he's headed. He tells me he's going to see a blacksmith. I'm not sure if that's a joke, seeing as I run the forge. When I ask him which smith, he tells me, a dwarven one and fall with ours. My face goes white, Kenra says. You look like you've seen a ghost. I say to him, no, have you? And he just smiles. What is the purpose of this odd blue gem? Well, Kenra was well aware. Kenra wasn't heading to any run-of-the-mill blacksmith though. He was seeking something far more powerful. A Dwemer forge capable of igniting the arsenal of kings. Such a forge exists, deep within the ruins of Falbanthars, located high above the mountains of Northwest Solstheim. The ruins have since been occupied by the Reiklings, the short blue creatures who call Solstheim home. Venturing inside, you'll discover that the Reiklings have attempted to delve deeper into the rune. However, Dwemer runes, if anything, are known for their deadly security systems, to which the unsuspecting Reiklings appear to have activated with their meddling. Further into the rune lies a forge chamber. Inside is the heretic, known as Kenro. Adorning a familiar helm and sword, what purpose could he have in being here? And just how did he obtain such an iconic piece of armour? After defeating Kenro in battle, we discover the answers to those very questions. On his person is an unenchanted weapon that may seem familiar to some. The same weapon that he was intending to enchant at the forge. It resembles the legendary sword, True Flame, once wielded by the legendary hero, Lord Inderel Nerevar, and the counterpart to its sister sword, Hope's Fire. This poses some troubling questions, 
Does this mean the Incarnate has finally passed? How exactly did Kenro acquire such powerful weapons, and for what means? It all becomes more clear when we discover that Kenro is in possession of Pyrol Tar, a substance once used by the Dwemer to enchant flames, and was used to give the sword True Flame its signature fiery namesake. So, who is Kenro? Well, he's a Dunmer, no surprise there, but there's something about his attire. He seems to be dressed as a disciple, or even a hand of Almalexia herself, dressed in their typical Ordinator uniform, including an ebony scimitar, a weapon usually only bestowed to the Ordinators of the Tribunal Temple. No one has seen an Ordinator in over 200 years, so how could this be? A note on Kenro's body sheds more light on this mysterious situation. I live to serve only her, always her. I have found the forge, and when its spark is lit, her fire will burn. The spectre once worked the gears of this swollen machine, but I no longer require his service. The mechanism is simple. With this vial of pyroil tar, I have all that is required to ignite it. Tar lit the flame once before, and Tar will do so again. And when I return triumphant, fire in hand, she will embrace me once more. But I have a problem. The machine requires four gems to power it, and I have procured only one. The others, it seems, are still out there, yet I have no doubt that as her chosen, she will guide me to them. For now, I will return to the temple. The entrance sits above the mine in Raven Rock, perched atop cliffs of basalt. But even if one finds the cave, only the devout know the way inside the temple. I spin the words, and the way opens. Kenro confirms our suspicions. He was in fact in possession of True Flame, and was attempting to re-enchant the artifact at the forge, using Pyral Tar. The note found on his person confirms this, and suggests he is not alone in this venture. He states he will be returning to the temple, to which only the truly devout of Armalexia can gain entrance to, ending the note with a code jotted in Daedric. It reads, A. S. V. High above the cliffs of Raven Rock, deep within a cavern called Ashfall's Tear, lies this hidden temple. In order to gain entrance, we must first disguise ourselves as one of Armalexia's faithful. I think Kenro's attire will suffice, as he won't be needing it anymore. Upon venturing into Ashfall's Tear, we'll be confronted by three stone pillars, bearing Daedric symbols. Harkening back to Kenro's note, we now know the combination is Armalexia, Sotha Sil, and Vivek. The ending of the words is Alm Sivi. Once you've proven yourself faithful to her lady, grab the chain to the left of the pillars, and pull it. The walls begin to tremble as a secret doorway begins to descend. Venturing through this newly discovered passageway leads us to the main entrance. A monolithic stone statue of the Blessed Mother Almalexia looms over the Ordinators keeping guard, watching over them with her ever-attentive gaze, a testament to the larger-than-life goddess she's perceived to be. Adorned in Kenro's attire, we can easily gain access to the inner sanctum and join the rest of Almalexia's faithful. This new sanctuary is very reminiscent of Almalexia's original chambers in her city of Mournhold. Although you might be compelled to immediately eliminate the denizens of this new temple, which is indeed an option, I caution you to tread lightly, as there is much more here than meets the eye. But who are they? This new group of heretics is led by Matriarch Drelvan, a dedicated follower of Almalexia, possibly since the Third Era. Matriarch Drelvan claims to confer with the Lady herself, whether this be through prayer, visions, or simply madness, the consequences of this newly found temple should not be underestimated. Surrounding Drelvan are her most loyal of servants, guarded by new, high-ranking ordinators, otherwise known as Hands. It would seem the influence of Almalexia has far from faded over time. The temple, although small at the moment, is growing ever still. It is apparent that the ongoing construction and excavation of the temple shows this is a serious operation, with no signs of halting. 
Although their numbers are sparse, each one is more devoted than the last to serve Armalexia, resulting in some petty rivalry. Take for example, Vespareth the Toe. She recounts in her personal journal about these inner petty conflicts. And a bar's a riot. Every day he reminds us how we're not worthy to wear his precious ordinator armor. Even though I'm pretty sure if push came to shove, I could take him. But since I'm not good enough to be her hand, just for fun, I started calling myself Amalexia's toe. A dirty little toe at that, with a lot of ash under the nail. Anyways, I tossed the idea to Inabar and knocked back another pint as the veins on his forehead started popping. <laughs> I also offered to anoint Sindras as Amalexia's navel. <laughs> because why not? There's enough body parts on her ladyship for all of us. Indabar didn't think it was very funny. Must be in the blood. Same goes for me, after all. My ancestors were armagers, loyal to Vivek, and more importantly, knew how to take a joke. Can't tell whose side Sindras is on, but you can't really get a read on what the mage thinks, given he's got a mushroom on his head. From Han Kaidren Indabar's journal, we can see just how seriously he takes the rebuilding of Armalexia's sacred temple. Five hands served her once, yet those numbers have dwindled. And as I deign to stand here along hedge wizards, cell swords, and other vermin on two legs, I cannot help but weep for the lady and her station. Still, I will not allow them access to the armory. They do not deserve the honor of wearing the sacred garb. To do so means you are an extension of the goddess. Our bodies and souls belong to her and are fortified by her divine magic. So it was for my ancestors and so it is for me. As such, I will not see my lady's hands covered in filth. The matriarch may have granted them a place on the dais, but while they stand eye to eye, they are still beneath us. And so, they are beneath her. I would slay every last one of them, but I stay my hand for her sake. As long as they are loyal and do the lady's bidding, I will allow their hearts to remain beating against their soiled flesh. Despite these petty quarrels, everyone has their place in her lady's new temple, such as the priest Drureth, the resident mage, and his assistant, Curate Melita. From his own personal journal, we can learn more regarding the fate that befell Erdin Relvil. The temple is almost complete, but there is work to be done. So much work, and not enough hands. Where once stood an army, now only a dozen of us remain. This would not be the case if the Matriarch had delivered justice to the Diviner, Erdin Ravel, for his blasphemous comments about the Corpus. Instead, she offered him exile, which to me was more of a reward than a punishment. Worse yet, he was allowed to sway Arthemus and a few others to join him. I cannot afford to let sedimentaries affect our decision. I need to remind her that we are at war, and every Dunmer lost is a soldier for the enemy. Quietly toiling away down the frigid corridors of stone is the sculptor, Visthar. The statue was my masterpiece, my one true love. Some say she is too large, too grand, but I would have made her a thousand feet tall if I could. For my love is a titan, and we are but useless worms groveling at her feet. However, to sculpt a goddess came with no shortage of anxiety. The pressure I felt to chisel every line, home every curve, and do so with exact precision was almost too much to bear. But the end result was one I took immense pride in. These days, the anxious voices in my head are no more. Instead, they speak in pitus, of ease and routine. I've fallen into a simple routine, making shrines with basic carvings and a tribute to the three. A. S. V. 
Yet it is risk that makes a sculptor an artist. It is daring that turned the ordinary into sublime. I dared to sculpt a goddess once, as I chisel away at those blocks of stone, doing the same tired work. I wonder, is it too late to be that bold again? Upon approaching Drelvan, she will treat you as any other devout follower, and we can inquire as to whether the goddess has any commands for us. The goddess commands you to recover the artifacts of her fellow god kings. We have received word that the Mask of Vivek is being transported from Raven Rock to an unknown ship at the dock. However, our contact at the docks says the courier is a member of the guard who patrols the bulwark, and he has plans of his own for the mask. He's arranged a meeting with a buyer after midnight at an unknown location. His greed angers the goddess. Track the guard's movements, dispose of them both, and return the artifact to her rightful hands. In addition, the goddess temple is in need of new servants, both to restore this temple and to provide valuable services. Speak to Priest Druith. He will hand you a letter to be delivered to the banished priestess, Aphia Velothi, in Raven Rock. She is a friend to the tribunal, and will translate it so that it can be passed to the common folk. When you meet her, be sure to also inquire about the whereabouts of our apothecary, Curate Melita. She had been in search of the Mask of Sothasil. Succeed, and you will gain access to the Goddess Armory. Fail, and you will incur her wrath. The law is as the Goddess commands. Heading into the mine of Raven Rock, we meet with Priestess Sophia Velothi, handing her the letters of propaganda and inquiring about the apothecary, Curate Melita. She will inform us that she hasn't seen the curate since she last left in search of the mask of the magician, Sotha Sil. However, she did just receive a letter pleading for her help, handed to her by a mercenary of Melita's. The letter gives us the curate's last known location. Priestess Velothi, you or, uh, whoever's reading this, I need your help. Well, that's a stupid thing to write, of course you're reading this. You wouldn't be staring at a piece of paper and not read it, would you? Uh, uh, unless you're illiterate or mad. Not angry mad, but I clip my toenails with a fork mad. You get what I mean. Point is, I think I found it. The Mask of Sothasil in Kegrenzel, a dwarven labyrinth with a surprisingly high vowel count. It's high up in the Velothi Mountains, and you're a Velothi too. <laughs> Funny how that works out. There's just one problem. I caught myself in some contraption, and now I'm not sure where I am. We've decided to make camp here and have one of the mercs I hired find help. He can't read or write or put together a coherent thought, but that's why I'm giving him this letter. Really, I should have just taken the mask and left the orb. You'd think I'd know better than to fall for a trap that obvious. But the orb was glowing and cute and looked kind of lonely. Side note, if you come rescue me, do not touch the orb. We must venture back to Skyrim, high up in the Velothi Mountains, nestled in its peaks, sits the rune of Kagrenzel. Now to venture inside to see for ourselves the very orb in which the curate spoke of. When one sees an orb, one must ponder it. By doing so will ensnare us in the same trap as the curate. Acceptance is an important quality to master, so accepting our fate we must until the floor below swallows us whole and casts us down into the depths of Kagrenzel. After a long and arduous journey through the cave systems of Kagrenzel, battling our way tooth and nail through hordes of Falmer, who now call these depths their home, we will reach an opening, following the flow of water into a small cavern. On her knees, and quite clearly being held hostage, is the curate Melita. After dispatching her captives, she will relinquish the Mask of Sothasil to us, trusting us as a temple faithful to bring it back safely to Matriarch Drelvan. Returning to Priestess of Fire Velothi, she will have ready for us the translated letters of propaganda, ready to be distributed amongst the masses of Raven Rock. Whether you wish to hand out these letters and extend the influence of the New Lady's Temple further is your decision. Should you decide to deliver these letters to the denizens of Raven Rock, the temple will flourish, not only in numbers, but in services too. The temple will see an expansion to Priest Druref's apothecary, along with a boost to the agricultural sections. The once abandoned cavern in the back of the temple will be restored into a living quarters, fitted with a forge and a blacksmith. 
Alternatively, you can report this blasphemy to Ofraloth and his priests of reclamation. Doing so will cripple the temple, as a brigade of Redoran guards and priests orchestrate a series of attacks upon the temple. The choice is yours. Night has fallen on Raven Rock, the bazaar is closed, and the bulwark is quiet. A guard like all the rest, standing guard at their station, turns to leave his post. Is this the courier Dravon spoke of? We'd better follow him to make sure. For twenty years all I've been is a loyal guard. I do what I'm supposed to, pay my taxes, and pray to the gods, but they return me no favours. I pray for riches, and I get guard duty. I pray for a good woman, and I get more guard duty. Now I'm supposed to deliver this expensive looking mask to the temple. Well it's time I made my own luck. I'm selling the thing to this imperial I met at the Netch. I'll just tell the priest a bloody mask got swatted by Gua. So good luck finding it now. Twenty years and I've never spoken a lie. They'll have no choice but to believe me. Trailing close behind, he will lead us to the old Aetius farm, since burnt down by the ash spawns, plaguing the island. Quietly down in the cellar, the exchange is about to take place. Is that you? Did you come alone? You weren't followed, right? Of course I came alone. What kind of fetcher do you take me for? So do you have it? The item your associate mentioned? Oh, I have it all right. I believe we already agreed on the price. Until our presence is spotted, causing the guard and the unknown buyer to attack. What, what was that? You set me up. I thought you said you were alone. Never should have come here. After interrupting this little black market transaction, we can search the pockets of the buyer. On his person is a familiar face, the visage of the warrior poet, the god king, the mask of Vivek, and another odd blue gem, not unlike the one that Kenro needed for the forge. We'll be keeping that for later. Meanwhile, back at Ashfall's tier, a pestilence has invaded the temple. Gruesome and twisted abominations spawn from the most unholy of magics. Disciples of the Sixth House, Ash Zombies, and Corpus Monsters. These are the minions of the Sharmat, Dagoth Ur. Fighting our way back inside, we find the Ordinators desperately holding off more Ash Zombies to protect their lady's temple. After this ruthless onslaught is over, we can find Matriarch Drelvan safe within her sanctum. Who orchestrated this attack on the temple? Who created these monstrosities? The second coming of the Lady's Temple has brought with it even more consequences than we could have realized. After returning to Matriarch Drelvan to inform her that we have indeed recovered the masks of the God Kings, she will bestow upon us the privilege of entering the most coveted area of the temple, the Armory. But what of these Ash Zombies? How could such creatures re-emerge after all these years? Drelvan passes us a note on the matter. Rumors have long stalked the temple halls of the return of the Sharmat, spreader of corpus, the corrupter of hearts, the architect of the Akulakan. I speak, of course, of the blighted one, Dagoth Ur. We now know this word has been spread by a traitorous priest who once served her faithfully, the diviner necromancer and my former friend, Urjan Relvil. It is his creations that accosts her temple, but I know not the source of his power. My fear is the truth may be found in the armory. Before we began building this temple, my predecessor gave me a gift, or rather, a responsibility. A box. The box was to be placed in the armory, but never opened. In fact, his voice stumbled at the mere mention of it, and his hands gripped the edges as if to drop it would shatter the world. As such, I heeded his warning when he begged me never to look inside. To this day, I do not know how to open the rear gate. Yet the restoration of this temple has required many hands and not all of them hers. It's possible someone has found a way inside. Take the armory key I've given you and investigate the area. Only with the full power of the tribunal and our goddess will can evil be vanquished. The note tells of one of the temple's once faithful priests, Erdin Relvel, the diviner whose scryings first discovered this temple. Drelvan also tells of a box kept locked away in the armory. The box was to be kept secret, and Drelvan was instructed to never open it, despite how tempting it may be. However, with these recent developments, 
I think the time has come. Inside the armory, shelves and display cabinets are amassed with sets of ordinator armor and weaponry, both the standard golden set and the most coveted silver and grey uniform of Armalexia's hands, amongst other relics of Morrowind's past. A mannequin at the end of the armory bearing the likeness and mask of the goddess, mother of Morrowind, Almalexia. To the right of her, we discover a discarded note written by the priest, Armathus, and along with it, a third gem for the forge in Felbenthars. The matriarch does not speak of what remains locked behind the gate. She says our way is to serve the goddess and the tribunal. But Erdin was right. The artifact speaks to us. I feel its heartbeat rattling in my head like a loose rock. Rattle, rattle, rattle. A curious song. Not a heart of blood, but stone. Yet the gate remains for all intents and purposes impenetrable. I see no levers or chains, no secret buttons under the display cases. There is nothing here save a few broken pillars and the mannequins. In fact, I grew so weary of their stares, I covered their faces with masks. It was not until that moment that the solution came to me. What if the mannequins themselves are the key? Three faces, and three masks, a tribunal. But which mask goes on which face? When memory fails, I go to the sculptor's room, and pray at the shrine so that I can match blessing to symbol. I feel now I can solve the puzzle, but without the masks, it is useless. Erdin hates it when I worry. He tells me to be patient, and masks or not, our master will show us the way. I have no choice but to believe. Armathus alludes to what might be inside the box, and how to open the gate that's sealing it away. It is clear that Armathus and Erdin are losing faith in Drelvin's temple. He speculates that to unlock the gate, the tribunal must come together, figuratively or literally. Perhaps the remaining masks must be present beside the goddess's mannequin. But in which order do they stand? In the sculptor's room, we can see the order in which Alm Sivi resides. Sothasil, the magician, the left hand of the goddess. In the middle, Almalexia, the mother of Morrowind. To the right, Vivek, the warrior poet, and the right hand of Our Lady. A. S. V. Alm Sivi. This must be the combination to unlock the gate. What was so powerful that it required the combined powers of the masks of Alm Sivi to keep it locked away from Nern? Why is it so that the chest must remain hidden, and what secrets lie inside? Fueled by curiosity and a little apprehension, we place our hand upon the chest. Disturbingly, however, the chest appears to already be unlocked. The dust that had since settled upon its lid had been disturbed recently. Nevertheless, as we slowly lift the lid on this mysterious casket, we make a discovery. There, nestled amongst the various papers and linen, lies the sister sword to true flame, Hope's Fire, the weapon once wielded by Almalexia herself during her reign of Morrowind, along with another note. This note details some very troubling news. I was told that without the masks, the gate would not open. But the priests underestimated my master's will. It was Dagoth Ur who opened the gate and beckoned me forward. And when I wear his face, I speak his truth. And from his words, I spawn a cure that will spread across the world. My temple brother, Arthamas, was first to receive its blessing. His once melancholy face has been carved into the most delightful shape, and his mouth stitched into a comely smile. He must have been quite pleased with the changes, as I have heard no complaints. I feel now that he is truly happy. You may have already met him, slain him with her hand. Perhaps you have met all my master's little pets as they descended on her temple. I knew this would happen, for there must come a time when the tribunal's champion will challenge my master, as the Nereverine once did. 
The tribunal has three heads, and you wear them all. And so, by opening the way, you are worthy of dying by my master's hand. Come to the graveyard by Tel Mithrin. My master's creatures will die on you there. Eredin claims to be the one who has already unlocked the chest with the help of his new master, the Sharmat, Dagoth Ur. From the note, we make a very startling discovery. The item that was so dangerous and posed such a substantial threat to all of creation that was supposed to be locked away within this very chest. The item is now missing. It was the mask of Dagoth Ur. Erdin claims the mask called to him, and through the powers of Dagoth still remaining within the mask, he was able to open the chest and claim it for himself. To don the mask and imbue himself with the very essence of Dagoth. With the mask now in his possession, Erdin desires to bring forth the divine disease known as Corpus and continue the work of the Sixth House. Erdin, or should I say, Dagoth Ur, now awaits us, the Tribunal's new champion at the Tel Mithrin graveyard. But he is a god. How can we kill a god? You have lost the temple, but you are not lost. The right place exists in the wrong time. Know that when the great egg Bardao cracked open, from its rotten yoke spilled the dissident priests and heretics, full of lies and falsehoods that give shape to Othraloth and his reclamation. But in reality, the bile spewed by the Lyrock cannot fool a minister of truth for long. The tribunal will rise once more and the Grand Inquisitors will judge all from the beginning. For entry to our temple is the ending of words. Om Savi. For now, the second coming of Ormalexia and the Tribunal has been halted, the reincarnation of the Sharmat defeated, and the mask now in our possession. What will you do with this power? 
A world-threatening disaster was avoided, but these masks pose troublesome questions. If the masks themselves do indeed contain the essence and power of the ones they depict, what could this mean for the future of not only Morrowind, the Tribunal, Skyrim, and even Tamriel, but indeed all of Nern? A power so great it could cause discourse of unfathomable proportions. Rise, Dover Keen, champion of the Tribunal. Go forth with these relics in your possession. Protect my people. Defend these lands. You no longer bear the burden of prophecy. You have achieved your destiny. You are free. Now go, mortal. Embrace your destiny and go with my blessing. <laughs>